from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, there were international visitors on the floor of the House, members of assemblies, political parties, congresses, and parliaments from around the globe watched West Virginia's legislature in action. And the governor's bill to ban texting while driving is the subject of long discussion in the House Judiciary Committee. These stories and a look at health issues at this session on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. A comprehensive bill changing the way coal mines are inspected and managed cleared the Senate today without a word of debate. Bob Brunner has the story. The bill requires more and quicker reporting of deficiencies. It establishes direct responsibility for failure at the mine level. It gives the families of accident victims the right to representation at investigations. It sets stiff criminal penalties for those disobeying the mine law. Yet when time came for debate and vote, the measure passed quickly and without comment, except an explanation from Judiciary Chairman Senator Cory Palumbo. Most people in the Senate have been following pretty closely the debate and discussion that went on in the House, and quite honestly, the House did a lot of work on it and, and really got it in the shape that, that most of the parties involved agreed with. So I think everyone in the Senate is happy to support this. I think we think it's going to take this, the state you know, a real big step forward as far as protecting the miners, but I don't think a lot of people felt a need to get up and, and, and talk about it. The unanimous support in the Senate came from inside and outside the coal fields. Obviously, we're very concerned about the upper big branch issue and, and trying to do our best to prevent things from happening in the past, although obviously we had laws before that perhaps weren't completely uh, enforced or adhered to. Uh, I guess it's our hope that by this deliberative process that led to this legislation between conversations in the House and the Senate and with the administration that we got uh, the best we could do under the circumstances. and, and, and I think we decided that uh, uh, further debate perhaps uh, would, uh, would, would be superfluous after all that's been done. Uh, I don't interpret the absence of debate, meaning a lack of knowledge with respect to the issues. Uh, we all understand the fundamental importance of uh, safety to the coal mining industry, and I think this is a good day for the state of West Virginia. It's a great day for miners and miners' families. I'm always reminded when somebody comes in and hires me as their lawyer, there's no greater trust they place in me than when they say, will you represent me and be my lawyer? Now we have a bill that says if there's a tragedy, that people who trust somebody can say, will you represent me at that hearing and find out what happened to my loved one? We didn't have that right here before, and now we have it. So it's a great day, I think, for safety and a great day for miners and their families, and I was proud to vote for the bill. There were a number of stirring speeches on the House floor concerning the landmark mine safety legislation. On the Senate floor, other than the bill's explanation, not a word. The Senate passed 16 other House-originated bills, most of them unanimously, with another 20 up for passage Wednesday. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Bob Brunner reporting. There may soon be a new Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs in the executive branch of government if a bill speeding through the Senate becomes law. The chair of the Senate Government Organization Committee predicts easy passage now that the legislation incorporates some existing agencies under a new umbrella. The committee is sending the bill to the floor for its first reading Wednesday. Senator Herb Snyder and bill supporter Reverend James Patterson say this is a good step. What we are attempting to do is link this with current efforts that West Virginia is already doing. Instead of just creating a standalone office that uh, would define its own purpose, we've linked them particularly with the Office of Minority Affairs that's already in existence, handling a federal grant over at DHHR. That was reasonable to put into the bill to put uh, them uh, their purview under this office. Also, by statute, uh, the Commerce Department, in their enabling legislation to develop the Department of Commerce, Commerce here has uh, in their mission statement to deal with minority affairs for business and job opportunities for minorities. And we're trying to link those current efforts with this office so that they have uh, complete 
uh, jurisdiction to go into a lot of areas, whether it's correction or health or commerce. Uh, I think we've done a good job of linking it with our current form of government, not inventing, reinventing the wheel, but making it fit into how we have government structured here. There are 3.2 percent of the population, which equates to roughly 60,000 people, and some of the wellness outcomes are pretty dismal. So we tried to figure out a way to impact that. So what we ultimately came up with was the Herb Henderson Office of Minority Affairs that would do several things to try to improve the well-being of those communities. The office would be named after Henderson, a well-known Huntington attorney and civil rights leader from the 1960s through the 1980s, who was also longtime state chair of the NAACP. The West Virginia House of Delegates today played host to 10 women legislators and political leaders from around the globe. Their visit coincided with a conference arranged by the Women's Democracy Network in Washington. Elizabeth Ativi is a member of the State Assembly in Edo, Nigeria. She and the other women were granted the privilege of sitting on the House floor next to their West Virginia counterparts. As the delegates dealt with matters concerning health insurance for public employees and domestic violence protective orders, Ativi said the main issue in Nigeria is terrorism. Terrorism has not been a part of us in Nigeria. We live as brothers and sisters in Nigeria and we have love for one another and love for our visitors. Uh, we are known for um, brotherliness. But very recently, uh, we, we we just begin to have issues of uh, terrorism. Morocco is an emerging democracy, just implementing a new constitution. Jalila Morsley is a member of parliament there. She and others in Morocco are working to place more women in political office. We had an increase in percentage in the uh, in women's in the legislature. We uh, were from 10 percent to 17 percent this year, and uh, we have also uh, representations in all local municipalities and city councils. So, and we are uh, trying to go to the percentage of 50 percent uh, in the future. We are beginning to be visible. But we are not there yet. We are not there yet. Uh, in the house, like my house, of 24 members, essentially I'm the only woman in the house, which is uh, very, very uncomfortable. Mudi George Bachemeg is running for parliament in the young democracy of Mongolia. She's currently an advisor to the Mongolian president on foreign policy and security issues. She's especially interested in mine safety, since her country has copper, gold, and coal mining. And she's talking with West Virginia lawmakers about narcotics and drug issues, which is also a problem there. But she is one of few women in government. I should say that status and uh, overall status and influence of women in Mongolian society is, sh can, cannot be underestimated. It's, 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 uh, but uh, in decision-making level, still we have very few women. So uh, I think we have common uh, situation internationally, even in the United States. So we are all women here in this group and we are discussing and learning about how we can improve this situation. And we strongly believe that having more women in the politics, then we can you know, make a difference. We can change this political culture in many uh, places in the world. But we are working hard to see that uh, we increase women participation in politics in Nigeria. No nation can develop without women. No. So we're trying to do our best. The Women's Democracy Network provides training and mentoring opportunities so women can gain experience in political and civil society and give them insight into the duties and responsibilities of an elected official in the United States. The House Judiciary Committee discussed changes to the governor's bill to ban texting while driving in two committee meetings today. As Adam Cavalier reports, the committee's considerations involved how cell phone usage is defined and how it should be punished. Senate Bill 211 makes cell phone use without a hands-free device a secondary offense. An amendment passed by the House Judiciary Committee takes that to a primary offense with increased penalties. 
The bill makes any usage of a cell phone without that hands-free device a moving violation, whether that's texting, checking GPS, or even receiving a voicemail. House counsel Robert Williams says the policy is different from state to state. Some of them said handhelds are, are, should be banned too. Others have said all different types of forms of distracted driving when it results in accident or causes you to have a moving violation should give an enhanced penalty. Different states are having different places they draw the line in the sand. This bill is just one possible approach you could take to it as a legislative body that would draw that line at the handhelds. But you're right, argument could be made that other types of activities are also dangerous. It's just at what level you decide to draw the line in the sand. Statistics cited to the committee indicate that drivers are 23 percent more likely to be involved in an accident when texting. Driving drunk and talking to someone on a phone are around 5 percent. Cabell County Republican Kelly Sabonia says it's not a cell phone issue, it's a distracted driving issue. I think that there's a lot of things that take our, um, you know, our attention away from driving and to just single out one activity over another. Now I know that their texting uh, does seem to cause more accidents than maybe some of the other activities, but yet they still are dangerous. I would like to see us increase the penalty for um, causing death or injury for any type of distracted driving activity. The committee spent an hour and a half of the morning session trying to ascertain what defined hands-free. Delegate John Overington came up with a creative solution. The uh, focus has been on whether it's handheld or not. If you duct taped the phone, the cell phone, to your steering wheel or your dash, that would meet that requirement? If, if you're not holding it in your hands by whatever uh, official or unofficial means you've been able to affix it to something, then that would... That would qualify as non-handheld at that point. The deputy commissioner of the Department of Motor Vehicles, Steve Dale, says they'd like to take care of all distracted driving, but texting is easiest. There aren't any statistics to show that the prevalence of, of eating cheeseburgers or fiddling with the radio or putting the CD into the CD player. There are no studies that show that that has increased or decreased over the past 10 years, but. The statistics are overwhelming as far as the use of handheld phones and the use of texting is just as a means, means of communication. And again, uh, we are looking at, at the low-hanging fruit, the most, the most um, prevalent form of a distracted driver. Kanawha County Democrat Misha Poor says regardless, it's still difficult to define, which makes the hands-free distinction crucial. I think it's necessary in saying you can't text. Well, how do we know you're not checking a, a GPS? Or how do we know? So we have to get some dis, you know, division in the texting and hands-free. And so that's kind of where we are. It's like just explain to us how are you going to monitor if someone's texting. Is that a primary? Is that a secondary? And I think at this point they've said it was a primary. Williams says it boils down to a safety issue and whether the bill will save lives. If you got in your hand at that point, we're going to say... We think it's against the public interest for allow people to have that. We're just going to bar you to have the handheld at all. That, that's what the states are moving to banning handhelds altogether, is looking at the way and the utility of having that in a way where you can't do it hands-free doesn't outweigh the interest in banning it altogether. On a recent trip to Ohio, it was about a three-hour drive. I had three instances where I was literally almost run off the road. And two happened to be from individuals texting. You know, it was very clear that I could see they were texting. And the third time, it was someone trying to eat a cheeseburger. Could have been a hamburger, could have been whatever. But um, I was just trying to drive home the point that, um, you know, I was literally run off the road three different times. In, in one trip, and it was from a variety of, of different um, distracted driving activities, not just from texting. The bill moves on to the House floor as amended. Should the bill pass, it will need concurrence from the Senate on making it a primary offense to use a cell phone without a hands-free device and drive. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. In a moment, a review of the health issues at this legislative session. First, here's a look at what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow.
Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, House Bill 4088, repealing the telecommunications tax. House Bill 4103, to authorize the Division of Motor Vehicles to take a lead role to plan and coordinate the consolidation of government services and enforcement of laws currently administered by various state agencies pertaining to the motor carrier industry. House Bill 4260, relating to insurance coverage for autism spectrum disorders. House Bill 4345, prohibiting the unauthorized sale of railroad scrap metal. House Bill 4530, allowing public utilities to sell bonds as a means of alternative financing to avoid consumer rate increases. And House Bill 4648, at the request of the state Supreme Court, to implement a domestic violence court pilot project. Among the bills on second reading, the amendment stage in the Senate tomorrow, House Bill 4130, to create a separate criminal felony offense for the sale or purchase of a child from the offense contained in the state code relating to adoptions. And House Bill 4307, clarifying that those persons who have a domestic violence protection order against them are prohibited from possessing firearms. Of the 2,026 bills introduced in the House and Senate, 283 of them are health-related. 54 are still active. We know this because our guest tonight monitors every single one of them. Tom Stevens is president of Government Relations Specialists in Charleston. Welcome. So glad you're here. Glad to be back, Beth. I want to talk to you first about the governor's substance abuse bill. This has been passed by the Senate. It's in the House Judiciary Committee. You said they met today. They did. About it. In fact, they met right before airtime and are going back tonight to continue the deliberations. This is the fifth committee that this bill has been in so far. Has the House Judiciary Committee so far changed any of its provisions? They actually have not. They, did, they went through a review of the provisions of the bill and the changes in each of the other committees. Um, they have a couple of amendments that are uh, pending, but they haven't taken them up for discussion yet. Mm -hmm. They will mm -hmm. after they reconvene this evening. Do you know what the amendments are for? Well, uh, it, there is sort of a ping pong effect with a couple of issues within the legislation itself that uh, have to do, well, these amendments will primarily deal with the sale of pseudofedrin type products. This is the cold medicine. Uh -huh. And whether or not there should be a prescription, is that the issue or what is the issue here? Well, the issue last year yeah. was prescription, to make it prescription only, and that bill passed the House by a three to one margin, but lost on a tie vote, very rare, in the Senate. This year, the issue is on limiting the amount uh, that you can purchase behind the counter mm -hmm. in a pharmacy. and. The governor's proposal uh, reduces the current level that's available, uh, but some of the amendments that have been adopted and then removed and then may be adopted again, well, actually were last night, but may be changed, that's, that's, that's been one of the focuses so of that's attention. The, that's the thing to watch in this bill. A lot of provisions in, in this bill, I want to go through some of them. Sure. Regulates methadone treatment programs, these methadone clinics. Yes. Uh, creates the Chronic Pain Clinic Licensing Act. These are pill mills. I guess I'm surprised that the state doesn't license or regulate them now? Uh, no, actually they don't. There are provisions for appropriate pain management and the use of prescription drugs for that, but licensing an entity as a specialized pain clinic and going through a regulatory process just to do chronic pain is what this legislation very appropriately deals with. So inspectors would go into these pain clinics, look at books, look well, at records? Well, they would, but actually you'd have to go through a process, physician-owned process for application to become a pain clinic. Uh, and this would apply to physicians that have more than 50% of their patients that are prescribed chronic pain medication mm -hmm. um, that, that then would have to go through that process, be licensed by the state, and go through an, an extra amount of review for their operation. The bill requires licensure boards to establish drug diversion training and best practice controlled substance prescribing 
for medical professionals. How do the medical professionals feel about extra training and drug diversion and controlled substance monitoring? Actually, I actually think it's an excellent idea and have worked closely with the governor's office on the development uh, of that, as have the licensure boards themselves that will uh, end up with this responsibility. We already have a little bit of, uh, of a requirement for pain management continuing education, but this uh, uh, leaves it up to the licensure boards to determine what is appropriate, uh, and the medical community thinks that's a very good idea. The bill provides immunity for prescribing practitioners to notify law enforcement of certain patient violations. If a doctor feels that the patient is doctor shopping or receiving or asking for controlled substances, does this allow the physician to contact law enforcement about that? With one condition, we have today, we have what's called the Controlled Substances Monitoring Program, where every controlled substance that's written by a prescriber and filled in West Virginia, mm -hmm. the pharmacy, uh, sends that electronically to the Board of Pharmacy and it's in a database that's accessible backwards to the dispenser, that's the pharmacy, and to the prescriber, that's the physician. So they can check that now. Um, this would require them to check that for the patient and if, they in, if there was an indication in reviewing the information that's in there that there was doctor shopping or pharmacy hopping, then they could report that to appropriate law enforcement officers for investigation. The bill regulates internet pharmacies and requires a valid practitioner-patient relationship prior to filling prescriptions. How does the state regulate internet pharmacies? Well, they can't actually uh, regulate internet pharmacies because of the Interstate Commerce Clause, mm -hmm. but it uh, does require, and you can do it in state law, that there has to be an established physician-patient relationship uh, rather than just a phone call or an internet correspondence. Lots more to talk about this, Bill, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Tom Stevens, always interesting. Thank you so much. Great to be back. <laughs> and here's a look at what's coming up in the House tomorrow. Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, Senate Bill 362 to authorize the issuance of $52 million in bonds for capital improvements for the Kakapin Resort State Park and Beach Fork State Park. Senate Bill 371, Governor Tomlin's bill to allow McDowell County to participate in a special improvement project. Senate Bill 387, to require all state, county, municipality, and local floodplain managers be adequately trained in floodplain management to mitigate the special flood hazard areas in the state. Senate Bill 410, to make West Virginia law consistent with federal law on withholding of personal income tax on gambling winnings. Senate Bill 424, to exempt barbers licensed in West Virginia for 30 years or more from continuing education requirements. Senate Bill 621, to require a major subdivision or land development to provide notice to a planning commission that the Division of Highways concurs that the development plan provides sufficient access to state highways. And Senate Bill 655, to allow the State Board of Veterinary Medicine to license a veterinarian who has a license from another state and passes an examination covering the laws and rules pertaining to the practice of veterinary medicine in this state. Among the bills on second reading, Senate Bill 166, making disarming or attempting to disarm a correctional officer a felony. Senate Bill 436, to encourage collaboration between the public school system and public higher education to promote programs of study and seamless curricula, and to require the State Board of Education to offer adult basic education programs on community and technical college campuses. And Senate Bill 579, to increase the special reclamation tax on coal from 14.4 cents to 27.9 cents per ton. And finally tonight, the House of Delegates honored its longtime Sergeant at Arms, O. Smith, today. Long and co colorful career of o. Smith has been absent from the floor Sergeant for several Arms years due to his health, but he's retained the title he's held since January 31, 1967. He's retiring from the post after 45 years. Therefore, be it resolved by the House of Delegates that this House of Delegates hereby formally notes the 45 years of outstanding dedication and service of O.S.W. Smith, Jr., its beloved Sergeant-at-Arms, 
thanks him profusely for giving of his life to this institution, and on this momentous occasion hereby formally bestows upon him the title of Sergeant at Arms Emeritus. Speaker Rick Thompson presented Smith with a legislative pin and the special House of Delegates medal. A representative of Governor Earl Ray Tomlin gave him the Distinguished West Virginian Award. Smith is known as a storyteller and historian. He served under eight House speakers and isn't afraid to give his opinion about them. Right now, we have the best speaker I ever served with. <laughs> There were a couple of real turkeys, but, uh, <laughs> but this one's all right. Smith's appearance during this last week of the session was a surprise. House officials arranged for him to travel by ambulance from Marion County to Charleston. And this has been the Legislature Today. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night.